going to be in John chapter 18 this morning, continuing through the Gospel of John. John chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. Um, I'm going to read actually 1 through 11, probably. John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. Now, before that, be my uh, appreciate the music, Zach and Ashley. Uh, be thou my vision. Okay, we're going to talk about Jesus today, that he may be your vision, that he is your vision. You remember that, Ashley? Remember that song? You, Abby, Kara, Julie, Holly. Was there another one? I'll never forget it. Why? That's my firstborn over there, in case y'all didn't know. Because that's my prayer for her. Same prayer I have for myself. Same prayer I have for you all. That Jesus would be my vision. And we will look at him today. I tell you, it's, a, it's just awe-inspiring to watch him. As he's going forth today in John chapter 18. That's the title of the message. Is he went forth. And he wants us to go forth. No matter our trials, no matter the testing, no matter that we live in this sin-cursed world, he wants us to go forth. Go forth in holiness. Go forth the way Jesus did. He's empowered us to do that. He's enabled us to do that. And we want to look at our example today, Jesus, and we talk about him often. And we show him forth to a world that needs him because we need him. John chapter 18, verse 1, when Jesus has spoken these words, John 17, he went forth. He went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he himself entered and his disciples, his followers, okay? Not just believers now, his followers, now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. That's the garden. He knew it well. He'd spent many times there with Jesus. He says, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples, with his followers. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and the officers... From the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth. Knowing these things, he went forth. Jesus knows full well what lays ahead, what lies ahead. And he said to them, Whom do you seek? Now he knew full well who they sought after. It was him. They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. He is italicized, means he said, I am. The great I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Not with the eleven, not with the disciples, but standing with those who come to seize him and to arrest him. Where are we standing today? When therefore he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, therefore, he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you, that I am he. Third time. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Let my followers, let these disciples go their way and take me. Remember, he said he would protect them in John 17. He would keep them. That the word might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I lost not one. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it 
and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus therefore said to Peter, put the sword into your sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And he went forth. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your son. Going forth, going forth, coming to this earth. May we still be reminded of what he did. Lived with you in heaven. He's come to earth. Lived among us for some 30 plus years. And now he's going forth to drink of the cup of the Father. To take on our unrighteousness and provide us with righteousness through this last act. He will accomplish the work, as he said in John 17. He will finish what? The Trinity and their divine redemptive plan decided upon. He is a finisher. He went forth. May we be like him. And not only our minds, but our actions, our attitudes. Father, thank you for what we'll learn today from your word. And through your son, who walked on the same earth as we do today. He's going to encourage us today. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. So when Jesus, we see that when Jesus has spoken these words, when he's spoken these words of his hour had come. Before he had said many times, my hour has not come. But now he says, my hour has come. The hour that he will face judgment for you and I. The hour that he will go to the cross, be slain. He thanks God in 17 of the authority that has been given to him, the authority to give you and I eternal life through this one-time act and our one-time faith in that act at the cross of Calvary. He says, I thank you in thy name. He says, to the men whom thou hast given me. He said that in 17. They have come to know your word. He says, Holy Father, thank you. Thy name, the name which thou hast given me. Thy name which thou hast given me. Thy word which thou hast given me. Sanctify them in truth and their word is true. Perfected in unity. That the world may know that where I am, that where I am, Thou can be also the ones that you've given me, O righteous, O righteous Father. Perfected in unity. Think about it, that where I am in relation to the Father, in fellowship and communion with the Father, he says, of where I am, not where I am going, but where I am. The great I am, the position and the condition of which I am, I'm offering to you. Thank you that, Father, your redemptive plan gives this to them, that where I am, perfected in unity with the Father. O righteous Father. He says, perfected in unity that the world may know, that the world may know, because we're not like them. We're not like an unbeliever. We're not like someone that does not follow. We follow and we're different. We're different because he has designed it that way. We're different because we believe. We're different because we continue to place our faith and trust in him. He says to keep them from the evil one, out of the power of the evil one. Out of the power of Satan. And he's going to show us that today. That the world may know that the Father, I desire that they, me and you also, whom thou hast given me, 
be with me where I am, perfected in unity, perfect in unity. I have made their name known and will make it known, O righteous Father, O loving Father, but righteous Father, righteous Father. Are we making his name known, O righteous Father? Righteous, righteousness. And the love, the sacrificial, one of a kind, out of this world love, agape, wherewith you did love me and love them, and I in them, he went forth. We see that he went forth with divine resolve to settle a solution. A solution to settle or find a solution to a problem, a dispute, a contentious matter. He went forward with the divine resolve to settle or find a solution to our sin problem, not his sin problem. He had no sin. And he is going forward. He is going forward with this divine resolve to settle this, what the Trinity de decided in eternity past to settle. And it is only one way it can be settled. And it's this way. A problem, a sin debt that we could not pay. You could never pay it. It's only eternally paid for in an eternal damnation in a place called hell or a lake of fire. That's forever and ever and ever because it can never be quenched. It can never be paid for by you and I, but by the Father and His act and the righteous Son. A dispute, a dis dispute between Satan and God. Satan desires to have your eternal soul. He knows exactly where he's going to live. And he wants company. A dispute. For your eternal soul. And this is the only way as Jesus went forward. To provide a way that once enemies... You and I, once an enemy of God, we can be a friend of God. When Jesus had spoke these words, he went forth. He went forth with his disciples. He went forth in not only paying your sin debt, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, what he did, the confidence in what he did on the cross of Calvary, Paying your entire eternal sin debt, taking away all your sins on one, on, think about it, one time faith. The moment you believed, the moment my children believed, their whole position before God changed. A child of God, once a creation of God, now a child of God. And not only that, because we didn't know that. I did not know this when I got saved. I did not know this when I accepted Christ. But at the moment I received, at the moment I received the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, believing the gospel, the moment I believed, he imputed righteousness to my account. I was talking with somebody this week, and, uh, and I said, how does God view you? And she paused for a minute. Well, it's as if he's looking at Jesus. I said, no, it is that he's looking at Jesus. Because the moment you believe, he took Jesus' righteousness, which we had none of, and he placed it in us, and he placed us in his Son. That's why the New Testament talks about being in Christ. And when he sees you, he sees the perfect positional righteousness of the living God. And of Jesus, who walked on earth with no sin, who has never had any sin. And that's how he views you, based on your one-time faith. That is wild. This happened to me at 14 years of age, and I hadn't got over it yet. And I'm not going to get over it. Praise God. And not only that, at that one-time faith, he done, the, he done another act. 
He not only imputed righteousness to my account, put it, placed it, but he imparted righteousness to me on that one time faith. He installed the Holy Spirit inside me. The Holy Spirit of God. That was way back at 14 years of age. I didn't feel that. I know that to be true. My feelings are like this. Saved, not saved. You know. I know that. The Word of God tells me that. Now I can impart righteousness. I can impart the same righteousness as Jesus because it is His righteousness. Because only righteousness belongs to Him. Remember when they were thinking about Him on the same level as a human and they said, Oh, good teacher. He says, Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Now in our culture, you know, we believe we're basically good people. No, it's actually the opposite. But God offers this to us upon one-time faith. He went forth, says, with his disciples, with his followers, with those who have stayed by his side for three years, left everything to follow him. I mean everything now. That would be like you leaving your house, your car, okay, Everything. Everything. Their trade, fishing. Some of them were fishermen. They left their trade. Everything. He says, these 11, Judas is not there. He's devising a plan. He says, with the followers over the ravine of the Kidron. Okay. The Kidron was located, it was a brook. A creek. It was flowing through between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, where Gethsemane is. And at this time of year, it was flowing. And Jesus says, they're going through this now on the way to a garden called Gethsemane. And he's walking with his sandals and the disciples too. And they go through the brook. And Kindron means gloomy, dark. Because the waters are dark and the waters look gloomy. Why? Because 256,000 lambs have been massacred on the Temple Mount. And it's flowing down into the ravine, into the brook. And as they walk through, the blood of those lambs is going over their sandals. And can't you think the Son of God is looking? He's going forth. And he sees the blood of the lambs. And he knows he's going to a garden to be betrayed. And that same blood in just a few short hours will be the blood of the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We do understand that, right? Those thousands of lambs only covered your sin. It only covered it. It only atoned for it. It only held back God's wrath. His dissatisfaction with you. But now this Lamb... It's going to take away. Remember John the Baptist? Behold. In the first part of the gospel. Behold. The Lamb of God. Which takes away. The sin of the world. My sin. He took it away. When God sees me. Not only does he. He sees no sin. Even though conditionally. I have sin. I have been. That has been taken away. That penalty for that has been taken away. Through what Jesus is doing here. He went forth. He went forth through the Kidron where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. Now, when you think of a garden, I mean, what do you think of? I mean, we go in our garden to do what? get things that grow, but we go out there, you know, we've planted, we've done all this stuff, there it is, we go out to harvest, go out to see it. I just look at my garden. It's a time, he, he had taken his disciples to this garden many times. This is a garden that he's headed toward because, you know, he knows, 
Now, he knows that when he gets to this garden, Judas is going to betray him, and his creation is going to betray him. His creation is going to betray him, and they're going to want his blood. He's going into a garden not like the Garden of Eden. A Garden of Eden with a perfect environment made for man, made for Adam. A perfect conditions for growth. Perfect delight is what the Garden of Eden means. Perfect delight. Perfect enjoyment. Now he's going to Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, which means oil press. Olive press. He is going forth to face a perfect enemy that the first Adam had no way he could win. But the second Adam, being Jesus, the Son of Man, is going. And he's going to win. Remember in the wilderness? When the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness, who won that one? Jesus. And he is going to this garden to win our freedom, to win your destiny, to win heaven, to win it for you, for to you live in a perfect environment with perfect circumstances and perfect peace, perfect enjoyment forever and ever and ever. And he went forth. If he doesn't go forth, we are without hope. We're out without hope in this life. And we're certainly we're without hope in the next. Jesus went forth. He's heading. You know, Jesus is not a runner. Jesus is not a fleer. He is walking right into it. Jesus is not a victim of his circumstances. Not a victim of his environment. We live in a world that whines about that constantly, and we cause all this stuff. He is no victim. It says, now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. Why is Jesus going through the brook, going up to the Mount of Olives, to Gethsemane? He must do this. He is going there because he knows, Judas knows that he's going to be there. Jesus said, I know where he hangs out because I have hanged out with him. And he is going to be there. And Jesus, and Jesus knows. So he could have avoided that. He had avoided it many other times when the hour had not come. But the hour had come and he is going up to the Mount of Olives knowing that Judas is coming. I mean, you get that? You understand that? And he did that for me and for you and for the sins of the whole world, a whole creation that was against him. He knew the place. For Jesus had often met there with the disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers chief priests and Pharisees they came with lanterns and torches and weapons okay so when Judas had received this in other words did he ask for this and why did he ask for this why did he ask for a Roman cohort which means 600 men armed with torches and weapons and lanterns why Why the lanterns? Why the torches? Because, see, they think Jesus is like us, that he's a runner. The full moon of the the Passover, you can see. So they bring the torches because they think Jesus is going, and they're going to have to go catch him. And he's not a runner. He's not a runner. He is walking right into the trap. It's no trap. It's a design of the divine resolve of the Trinity. 
It's unbelievable. I believe it. You believe it. Now they're coming to get with 600 men plus Pharisees, Sadducees, officers, all this kind of, I don't know, 1,000 men, okay, in a garden. I mean, it's got to be cramped in the garden, huh? You know, with all these olive trees. They're coming to get him. And why? Why so many? Well, Judas knows he has healed the lame. He has healed the blind. Hey, guys, he has raised the dead. I was there. The sea and the wind obey him. We need more people. He sent demons into pigs which went off a cliff. Even the demons obey him. There is something so different about this guy. And we need a bunch of people. He cleansed the temple twice with the whip. One man. Run out thousands of people from the temple. Turning over tables. Judas witnessed that. Power and authority. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that were coming upon him, in verse 4, went forth. Jesus knew that. He knew how many were going to be there. He knew that they were coming. He knew the plan. He went forth and he said to them, Who do you seek? Now what would we do? I know what I'd do. I'd put Spencer up here. And I'd be back here. No, Jesus says, who do you seek? Who do you seek? Jesus, don't run from a fight. Satan, who do you seek? Who do you seek? Who do you seek, evil one? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now that's power. Jesus says, I am. And we're talking about a thousand people just fell back like dominoes. He just said it. Listen to this. We'll get to it in CT. I hope you're listening to CT. We'll get to it in 2 Thessalonians. Listen to this verse. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. That's power. That's power. That's power. With the breath of his mouth. I am he, and they fell back. They drew back and fell to the ground. And they therefore, and again, therefore, he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He continued to go forth. But we have Judas. I mean, it doesn't say it in this passage, but other gospels record it. Judas betrayed him. How did he betray, betray him? He goes up to him, and he gives him a kiss. How low is that? A kiss of adoration. A kiss of affection. A kiss of fondness. A kiss of devotion and allegiance to the Savior. In another passage, Jesus says, Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? And before we can get off of that, you know, you're sitting here today and we're in worship and we're talking about Jesus. 
But when we sin, do we realize that that's exactly what we do? That when we don't give out or bring forth that righteousness of His that belongs to Him, and He deserves to have it returned to Him via the Holy Spirit, that we do the same thing. Do we betray our Savior with a kiss, with affection? I love you, Jesus, but I want to do this. I love you, Jesus, but I want to go do my will. Not the Father's will be done, but my will be done. I betray you with a kiss when I use profanity. You ever thought of that? That's what you do. That's what I do. That's what you do. While portraying affection and fondness and devotion and allegiance to Him, anytime we sin, anytime we lust, anytime anything like that, we betray Him in action. Verse 7, and therefore He asks again, whom do you seek? I mean, Seriously? He told Judas to do what he had to do. Jesus answered in verse 8, I told you that I am he. Bring it on, is what Jesus said. (laughs) You got to love Jesus. Bring it on. Bring it on, Satan. I am ready to deliver my creation and my people by this one-time act. Bring it on. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. Let my disciples, and what did they do? They ran. Don't be too hard, because you would have ran too. I would have ran too, okay? But he's no runner. That doesn't mean we can run now, okay? Because, see, we live in a different economy, a different dispensation where the Holy Spirit has indwelt us. They didn't indwe- he hadn't indwelt them. Okay? Don't be a runner. Don't be a victim. Not a victim of your circumstances. Not a victim of your environment. We ask for this, okay? We ask for it. Let let these go their way, that the word be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me. I lost not one. Because if these 11 are going to fight, and we'll see what happens there. If they're going to fight, he's going to lose them. How's he going to lose them? They're going to kill them. And then all those things that we heard about the apostles and disciples after Pentecost, we wouldn't hear that. He said, Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, okay, he drew it. Having a sword, he drew it, and he took it. Okay, this is a fisherman. Maybe it's a fishing knife, I don't know. And he struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Okay? Okay? So Simon reacts, and there Jesus said to Simon, put the sword into the seed. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? You got to give it to Peter, though, for doing this, because if Jesus doesn't send him away, or they don't let him go, or they doesn't, you know, they don't uh, let him go, then they all die. The sword. This is a sword representing our own flesh and our own strength and doing things our own way. We do this a lot. We pay, pay attention to God's word. I mean, 
Isn't it awesome what Jesus does? They're going to take him away. They slice the ear off of Malchus, the high priest's slave. And Jesus does what? Picks up the ear and puts it back on. What? <laughs> Who can do that? Who can do that? Who would do that? Not that he can do it, but why would he do that? He loved Malchus. What? What? For God so loved Malchus that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, what do you think he thought when he healed him? Who does that? Who loves the enemy? Well, in the New Testament, it tells us to love the brethren and love. It tells us that our enemy. Our enemy. And that's not in the same house now. Even though sometimes we can think that. Love the enemy. And then he says, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink of it? Should I not drink of this cup? And what cup is that? The cup of the wrath of God can only be satisfied by Jesus' act. That one time act on the cross of Calvary. I want us to understand. I, I want to understand even better. What happened there? The wrath of God that I deserve, the wrath of God that you deserved. We earned it. We earned that death penalty. I have earned it. I have well earned it. And Jesus with the Father has never ever been separated from the Father. Ever. And God is asking his son to do this act. And this act will cause the father to turn his back on his son and turn toward us. Not just that he turned his back on his son, but he turned toward us. And do we live our life with this remembering, recalling? Or do we hear this over and over and over and easily we forget when it comes to sacrifice? When it comes to giving. When it comes to decisions we make. Jesus went forth. With that last time act on the cross of Calvary, his finished, completed work, he quenched the anger, the wrath of God towards sin and sinners, of which we all are. I mean, I can somewhat understand it if when we got saved, he took it. Not only did he take my sin dead away, but then I would, I would just walk with him continuously. But that didn't happen. It's not happening. So in closing, is that we have a close? No song today. Okay. In closing... He went forth. Okay? He, Jesus, both man and God, went forth in a garden. Not in a garden that's not like your garden. Okay? And I'm talking about the garden of this world, in sin-cursed world, he went forth. And you see no excuses. I mean, I was talking with someone, a young lady, She's in a garden. And it's a cursed garden, I'm telling you. The household is cursed. Living in sin, not her. Living with a person that rejects God. Antagonistic toward God. She's talking with her, she's crying. She's discouraged, goes from discouraged to disappointment. But then she says, but I have peace. How?
How does that happen? How does a woman respond in such a way? I am simply amazed. I just want to go. No, I'm just telling you. Okay. This is wrong. Okay. I get it. I want to go knock on the door. When he opens the door, punch him in the face. Okay. Is that on YouTube? Probably. That's just what I want to do. See, that's the sword that Peter had. I want to do this. And that's not what God does. Jesus doesn't do that. That's not what he, he punched Satan in the face. <laughs> I love this story. Of course, I love this story. Because it's my story. Because it's his story. It's history. <laughs> and then, you know, the kiss, the betrayal. I uh, <laughs> was talking to somebody else. Spouse comes in, gives a kiss, and then she says, Honey, what have you been looking at? Busted. And what did she do? Did she leave him? Nope. Stayed by his side, stayed with him. I mean, who does that? Who does that? Betrayed with a symbol of affection, deep love, intimacy, and you act that way, but the other person kept loving. I mean, who does that? I just smile too. That's got Jesus wrote all over it. And the sword we've talked about, our fleshly desires, searching for a way out, and we figure our way out. We're great managers of our life, aren't we? We think we are. Instead of going with God's plan. And then the cup. I mean, what's your cup of, what cup are you drinking of? Remember, Remember Jesus says, when the disciples said, We'll drink that cup. Do you remember that? He says, are you able to drink of this cup? They said, sure we are. Remember that? And then Jesus said to these 11, actually, you will. It won't be now, but you will. Those 11 never never cease going forward for Jesus. Peter, with his sword, not this sword, but with the sword of the word of God, the spirit of God, at Pentecost, preached and 3,000 souls were saved and delivered from the penalty. Those souls that probably were part of this mob, Peter has, Peter has now turned. And now he's walking by the spirit and walking by the power of Jesus of who he walked with. That's awesome. May we... May we continue to go forth, okay? Continue to go forth as our Lord and our Savior did for us. And he has provided that way for us to do. Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for all those people I meet that go forth. Wow, those ones I was talking about. It does seem I have a a lot of conversations with ladies that what divine resolve, not their personal resolve, but divine resolve to go forth. To walk with you, to honor you. May we have men that do that. Go forth with resolve. To settle. To settle. Find a solution. Settle the dispute, a contentious matter, as your son. Father, we thank you for the encouragement we have in your word. Thank you for your encouragement of how you positioned us righteously before you, based on one-time faith. You do desire for us to continue to walk by faith, but it has nothing to do with changing our destiny, where we will spend eternity.
because of our faith in that one-time act of Jesus at the cross of Calvary. Thank you. May we go forth this week in a garden that is not a perfect environment. It's not perfect circumstances, conditions. But, Father, we are built by the Trinity of God, built to thrive, to strive, to live, to bring forth life, eternal life, to all those we come in contact, no matter our circumstances. Thank you for that encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can.